It's The World This Week, seven days, four Paris based correspondents, one hour. The World This Week, in partnership with The Daily Beast. We say four Paris based correspondents, but we've gone cross channel for this one. Nico Hines, London editor of The Daily Beast, joins us. How are you? Very well, thanks. Also uh, with us, uh, German television producer Ulrika Kolterman. Welcome back. Um, Welcome back as well to Catherine Fields, Europe correspondent for New Zealand Media. Bonsoir. Busy week? Busy week. Right. Very busy week. And Victor Mallet, Paris Bureau Chief for The Financial Times. How are you? Good, thanks. The uh, World This Week on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag World This Week. An anniversary commemoration. Well, it's a chance to reflect on two moments in time, really. Then... And now. I thought I was going to drown. I went off a landing craft in a Jeep, and the Jeep sunk, and I had to swim in. All right. Uh, they're, they're one of the uh, D-Day veterans uh, speaking. Uh, that, uh, that man had never been back uh, to uh, the Normandy uh, beaches. And this uh, 75th uh, anniversary, you had the sense, Catherine Field, that, uh, well, this was the last one. This is the last one, I think, with veterans, which is a real shame because it's when you're actually talking to the veterans that you get an actual feel of what happened, what they went through. If you're in the, if you like, the pool enclosures with the media and you're just sort of bust from one place to the other and you see politicians making speeches, you don't get the sense of what the human cost was of D-Day. And I'm always so moved when you meet these veterans at these events, just how humble they are when you, you say to them, thank you. And they say, I did nothing. You know, I just came ashore. I did this, I did that. And it's also moving when you're with the local French people. They're still coming out, you know, France, all these, these people who weren't even born come out to these small villages when the veterans are there and say, thank you, thank you. And you're right. I think this will be one of the last when we see the veterans, the guys who came ashore on D-Day, which will make it more difficult, I think, for future generations to connect in the way that we've been connecting with them up till now. Yeah, first-hand stories. Uh, Vic, Victor, you and I were at an event on Wednesday in the uh, Normandy city of Caen. There was one African-American veteran who's, who reminded us that uh, he landed on D-Day but only got the right to vote 10 years later. And uh, those kinds of first-hand stories, this is almost the last chance. Oh, I, think that, I think that's right. And also, those veterans remember how extremely bloody it was. You know, as, as a child in the UK in the 1960s, you were led to believe in the, the glory of war, you know, the glory of Dunkirk, the glory of D-Day. But when you read accounts or hear the veterans talking about those days, the day of the landing on D-Day and the, the days afterwards, it was extremely bloody close uh, close fought, uh, you know, battles in, in the bushes and fields of Normandy. And it was extremely nasty kind of warfare on, on all sides. Uh, and it's really important to remember that. I thought the other interesting thing was during the week of these D-Day commemorations, we had both Queen Elizabeth of the UK and Emmanuel Macron of France reminding Donald Trump, uh, you know, of the importance of standing up for liberty and freedom, and that this was in America's, you know, great traditions of of doing that. Uh, and I, I thought it was quite significant that they both felt the need to remind him, uh, you know, of, of what made America great and why people still look to America, uh, and why they hope to continue looking to America as a defender of freedom and, and democracy. Yeah, Nico Hines. In the case of Queen Elizabeth, of course, in a sense, we are talking about. Uh, a World War II uh, veteran since uh, she never left London and uh, uh, to played a part during the war. Yeah, and she said this week um, that the last time there was one of these big celebrations that everyone was saying, this is the last time you'll see real veterans, this is the last time I'll be around. And, of course, she was here still going strong. So I wouldn't rule out the possibility of, say, the 80th anniversary still having um, some of those survivors because these people are so tough and so impressive. Um, it is true that she um, gave that message to Donald Trump. And, you know, I think it would be fair to probably expect that Donald Trump didn't really take the message on board. He doesn't really seem to take many messages on board. His speech kind of tried to sound as though he was supporting these tough alliances. Um, but actually, when you looked at the detail of what he was saying, he didn't make any commitments to the actual alliances such as NATO, which sprang out of this uh, conflict and which have kept us safe ever since. So. I suspect he just enjoyed the photos and he'll be heading back home without it having too much effect on him, whatever he says in his Fox News interviews.
Yeah, Ulrika Kulterman, uh, Donald Trump in the speeches he gave, both the toast at um, uh, with the Queen and the speech he gave at, at Omaha Beach uh, on D-Day, he employed the word crusade quite a lot. Yeah, anyway, he behaved a little bit as if D-Day was like Donald Day. But uh, um, there was a lot of irony in the whole thing because he came to celebrate something that an LA defended um, Europe and that was something that he would never do today. So it was very ironic that he he celebrated these veterans for something that he would not support today. He even said le last year uh, before the NATO summit, why should we defend Montenegro, for instance, if Montenegro was attacked. So he is not at all, he doesn't share the political views of his predecessors anymore. So his presence was sort of comical in a way. Right. I said. Nico Hines saying that uh, it's hard to get the message through to the U.S. president. And uh, yeah, Emmanuel Macron making it crystal clear that uh, get in trying to get through that message, paying tribute. Uh, uh, very vocally uh, to those institutions that came out of World War II, the UN, NATO, a Europe at peace, all within earshot of the current U.S. president. We know what we owe to America. America, dear President Trump, which is never as great as when it fights for the freedom of others. America, which is never as great as when it shows its loyalty to universal values that its founding fathers defended when almost two centuries ago, France came to support its independence. Are we just living in a world where, I guess, people can just kind of go show up at these... It was a strange D-Day. I mean, people can show up and kind of just talk at cross-purposes. I, I think we, it's very easy to say, look, Donald Trump did well. But in fact, all he did was read his speeches. He behaved relatively well, and 90% of the time he was OK. But his speech was so out there. You know, this was supposed to be a time when we're looking ahead, looking at what Europe can do, looking at what the alliances can do, looking at what can be achieved from peace. And he was talking about, you know, quite rightly, what, the, what happened on D-Day. But... This is all about to be looking ahead, looking at what we can achieve, not this kind of weird speech that was, hey, as you say, look at me, it's Donald Day. It could have been a lot <laughs> and he worse, did not... <laughs> given, Yeah, given his previous record, it could have been a great yeah, deal, yeah, a great deal he worse. didn't even yeah. go uh, yeah. to honour the veterans because it was raining uh, in November. Yeah. But uh, we, what is also said, that he never really talked about America's role today, so it was a lot of shoulder clapping with Macron mm -hmm. and showing off a sort of transatlantic relationship that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, as no, he was it more be. interested in talking about the Queen. You were saying it was Donald Day. You know, even in France, he kept on saying how much, you know, what an amazing lady Queen Elizabeth was and how he and she got on really okay, well so, these days. You know, so, so, Victor Mallet, uh, there was, after the, the ceremony at the American Cemetery uh, above Omaha Beach, a lunch that took place in calm between the two presidents, Emmanuel Macron and Donald Trump. If they're just kind of talking across purposes, what was that lunch all about? I think it was about sort of trying to keep the relationship on an even keel, to be honest. Uh, you know, the, the French, I think, were very worried that it would all, you know, that Trump would start tweeting the way he did. Uh, he often does when he's about to arrive somewhere or when he's just left. Like he did before Which Armistice is, Day and last exactly. November. Exactly. And, you know, he was kind of insulting Trump. Uh, sorry, Trump was insulting Macron about the gilets jaunes and that kind of thing. So there's always the risk. And that didn't happen, which I think was a good thing. But in terms of, of substance, as, as you were saying, you know, the idea that there will be sort of substantive talks about America's role in a future transatlantic alliance, uh, that was never going to happen. They did allegedly talk or apparently talk about, uh, you know, certain issues of the day like Libya and Iran and so on. But I think uh, it was, you know, th in terms of what the French and the Europeans wanted out of this, and, and even the British probably, it's, to some extent, it's about damage limitation. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of become the new normal, this kind of awkwardness during his three-day state visit to the UK. Donald Trump sparing Theresa May the rough treatment of last year. You'll recall at the prime minister's uh, uh, country residence checkers uh, at that time, he had praised her rival, Boris Johnson, in her presence. Uh, it was awkward. Uh, this time, he was much more gracious in her presence when they held a joint press conference. He could afford to be. 
He knew it was three days before she stepped down as leader of the Conservative Party, a Conservative Party unable under her watch to deliver Brexit. Obviously, uh, it will be for whoever succeeds me as Prime Minister to take this issue forward. Uh, what is paramount, I believe, is delivering on Brexit for the, for the British people. Um, and I seem to remember the, the President suggested that I sued the European Union, which uh, we didn't do. We went into negotiations and we came out with a good deal. Yeah. That's not such a I would have sued, but that's okay. <laughs> I would have sued and settled, maybe, but you never know. She's probably a better negotiator than I am. So, Nico Hines, that's said in kind of a glib manner, and you can hear the journalists laughing at it. It's kind of become the new normal, these kinds of remarks. But when you, if you suddenly suffer a sense of humor failure, it's quite serious what the President of the United States is saying, sue the European Union. Yeah, and I detected a hint of sarcasm in his uh, suggestion that perhaps he thought Theresa May was a better negotiator than him. I think one thing we know for sure about Donald Trump is that he doesn't think anyone's a better negotiator than him. So um, <laughs> I think that was a little jibe in her direction. Um, but, you know, the, the things that he suggests are just in, completely crazy. Obviously, Britain couldn't sue the, the EU over this. Um, having said that... Um, I think even some of the serious politicians and Boris Johnson, I don't know if we include him amongst the serious politicians, but I think a lot of politicians here do believe that there could have been a better job of negotiating this Brexit deal uh, with the EU. Uh, Theresa May has been an absolute failure when it came to that. And, you know, she formally stepped down about an hour and a half ago, um, and it was just a press-released letter that said she was leaving today officially. A non-event. It was a sad, forgettable end to a sad, forgettable premiership. Well, she stays on as caretaker prime minister while we, we, we wait to see if uh, Boris Johnson uh, does become the next leader of the Conservatives and thus the next prime minister. Uh, Nico, just we, one of the other important aspects before we talk about the leadership contest is during this three-day state visit, um, how did it go between the U.S. president and his hosts when it came to talking about the big, beautiful trade deals they'd have post-Brexit? Well, Donald Trump got himself in all sorts of tangles. Uh, you may know that one of the things that Britons love more than anything is, the, is our National Health Service. It's kind of like a religion in this country. Um, and Donald Trump, in that joint press conference, said that it was on the table when it comes to negotiating a trade deal. And that would mean that we would potentially change the way that drugs are acquired in this country for the National Health Service, which provides for everybody, um, to allow the big US uh, companies to make more money from our health service. And that is absolute electoral suicide, anyone who was to sign <laughs> up to that. Um, there are other aspects um, of the potential trade negotiation, such as the other example that's become famous is this chlorinated chicken, which is allowed in the US not allowed um, under EU rules. Um, and these things really have caught the public imagination. And so it's going to be extremely difficult and it's going to be very sensitive for any prime minister to try and convince the British people that they should allow these substandard, what they see as substandard anyway, American uh, regulations to come in here. And Trump did not help with that subtle messaging. Obviously, that's beyond him. So, uh, where does the, by the way, Victor, where does the Financial Times stand on chlorinated chicken? Uh, I expect we're against it. Um, <laughs> uh, we certainly were in favour of Remain. I don't know where we stand on that now. Uh, but I, I, I thought the sad thing was that uh, you know the, the satirical magazine Private Eye had a had a had a front page cover um, for Theresa May's departure with with you know all her achievements, uh, and it was just a blank white front page uh, of Private Eye. You know this magazine, and because you know the, the view in Britain is that she's just ended up dividing the country. When she stood in front of Downing Street and, and uh, did get a bit emotional, announcing that she was stepping down as leader of the Conservatives, she drew a lot of sympathy. People said, look, this was mission impossible anyway. I guess that's right, but but I think a, a lot of people also thought she could have done she could have done a lot, a lot better. You know, she she on the BBC this morning there was a commentator saying she'd left everything more divided. She's left the country more divided. She's left her party, the Conservative Party, more divided. She's left Parliament more divided, and and that is not an achievement.
I think it's hilarious because the end of May is like another Brexit. She's leaving, but in the end, she's still staying. So nothing has changed, <laughs> just, <laughs> just really it will, sad. Though. It will change. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like shifting the deck chairs around on the Titanic, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's still, the iceberg is still there. Will Brexit happen? Won't Brexit happen? Who's going to be in the driving seat when it's meant to happen? I, it, it just goes from one completely bizarre situation to another. And then when we look at those candidates who are around, there's not one of them who really has a clear plan for yeah. Brexit. Yeah. Among the 11, there's one who is for a second referendum, which I think is still the best choice, because when they voted, they didn't know what they voted right. for. We'll see if Conservative so, Party rank and file vote for that one. Right, but uh, all the other who are around, they don't have a clue what they're yeah. going to do with Brexit. Yeah, and remember her main purpose as Prime Minister, as she said herself, you know, Brexit means Brexit. She was going to deliver it with a deal. And in the end, she didn't deliver it. So even the thing which a lot of, you know, half the British people don't want anyway, she didn't even achieve that. I, I think it's a... It's not a good legacy, unfortunately. And also, there's always talking about going back to Brussels and renegotiating. If there's nothing else Michel Barnier has said in the last few months is we are not negotiating anything else. The withdrawal agreement, that's it. There's no more negotiating. But they're still talking about going back to Brussels and getting a better deal. And Nico Hines, talk us through the coming months because uh, we have a leadership contest now for the Conservatives, right? Then there's summer recess for the uh, parliament, and October 31st is the looming deadline uh, for, uh, for, for Brexit Day now. Mm. And traditionally, nothing really happens in British politics from around about now or in a month's time, as you say, summer recess at, at the end of July, until actually October itself, because that's when the Conservative Party conference And, and we could uh, get Nico in between, we could get in between, uh, perhaps, if there's a vote of no confidence, a general election, right? That's right. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting um, talking about, you know, what has changed. And th look, there are lots of different candidates running and they all have very different perspectives. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter what they say. The EU's position is basically going to stay the same. And potentially more importantly, the balance of power within the House of Commons is exactly the same. Because th there's no, it's not going to be any easier for either a moderate, soft Tory Brexiteer or a hard one like Dominic Raab or Boris Johnson, they're still going to be trying to convince the same MPs to come to some sort of compromise. And nobody wants to make a compromise. So it looks to me as though we're heading for some sort of electoral event, because even the hardcore candidates, and so far only, well, one or two of them, have said that they will actually do something called proroguing Parliament, which basically means shutting Parliament down um, in order to force a no-deal Brexit through at the end of October. I mean, this would be absolutely one of the most controversial, constitutionally um, problematic things to have happened in hundreds of years in this country. Um, I was meeting um, with some other kind of, uh, shall we say, fringe elements this week um, who were suggesting that they could actually call an election just before the um, no deal date is uh, reached so that there'll be no one here to take a vote and then we'll accidentally fall out um, to try and force through a no deal. But at the moment, there really is no clear way forward other than to have either a vote or a second referendum. Now, the second referendum, absolutely mm. nobody will say that they want that. However, nobody in the Conservative when it party. comes to a vote in Parliament, it is, when it comes to a vote in Parliament, it is possible that someone could convince MPs to hold a second referendum because that means they get to keep their jobs. If they have a, an election instead, then they may all be out of a job. All right, Europe watching the endless Brexit and Donald Trump on one side. On the other, well, they got Russia and China to worry about. Uh, worry about, we'll talk about it. When we come back, you're watching The World This Week. <laughs> 